All right, our technical difficulties are uh, no longer difficult. Let's uh, stand and pray, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art ever present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come dwell in us. Cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen. I should say, you know, we're study, doing a s study of Desert Fathers. We have uh, other <coughs> saints that we call fathers, like bishops we call fathers among the saints. So when, we, when you hear that um, prayer through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, why don't we say through the prayers of our fathers and mothers, you know, because there are women saints too. But that prayer is not talking about the saints. That prayer is talking about our fathers in Christ who are alive. So our bishops, through our prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. So we're actually talking about those who are living. We're praying to Christ that those who are living would intercede for us and watch over us. Um, and we see this you know, really clearly when a bishop serves at the end of the service. First, the priest says, well, first, the bishop says, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. So he's, you know, um, asking Christ for the other bishops to pray for us. But then the priest says, through the prayers of our Holy Master. So we kind of go from general fathers you know, to very specific to the bishop who's serving that service right there. So if you ever hear someone say, oh, we should say through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers. Number one, you know that they are progressive and liberal and don't want to uh, hold on to the faith that's been handed down to us. They want to advance some kind of agenda, feminist agenda. But number two, they're not talking, the prayer doesn't talk about the saints who have passed on. So with that, I'll get to uh, the subject at hand, which is, our venerable father, John the Dwarf, or the Short, whose memory we celebrate on the 9th of November. We'll never hear about him in the services because that's also the feast day of St. Nectarios of Agina, and uh, we'll always do services for him and he'll trump everything. Sorry, St. John. Our Holy Father John lived in the desert of Scythis in Egypt during the fourth century. He began his monastic life under the direction of Abba Amois, who was from the Thibet. One day his elder took a dry wooden stick and planted it in the ground, saying, water it every day until it produces fruit. The water was so far away that it meant leaving in the evening and not getting back until the next morning. But John performed this task without complaint, and after three years, the wood came to life and produced fruit. His elder picked the fruit and carried it to the church the following Sunday, saying to the brethren, Come and eat of the fruit of obedience. For twelve years, John was harshly tried by his elder, who never gave him a word of thanks. But before dying, Amois exclaimed, He is an angel, not a man. You know, this piece of information about the life of St. John reminds me very much of the relationship between Elder, now St. Joseph the Hesychast, and his spiritual son, Elder Ephraim, who passed away uh, almost two years ago now in Arizona. Elder, uh, Elder Joseph would never call Elder Ephraim by his name, but he'd always, I don't remember exactly the term, he'd always call him some kind of demeaning term to teach him humility. And there's like, I think there's only like three times that he can remember that he actually called him by his name to teach him the greatness of humility. And I think uh, Elder Joseph would say the same about Elder Ephraim, that he became an angel. John then went to live in solitude in an underground cave. He dwelt peaceably in Hezekiah with fasting and vigil as companions concerning 
concerned only to be united to God through constant prayer. He prepared manfully for the onrush of evil thoughts and would flee to his Savior in prayer. Weaving baskets was the work of his hands, but he cared little for the profit it could bring him. Often when his spirit was wrapped in divine ecstasy, he would weave on regardless until the basket was so large that it touched the wall. When, to his amazement, John was delivered from the battle against evil thoughts, Abba Piman advised him to beg God for something else to fight against in affliction and humility. For this is the way the soul makes progress. John attained a high degree of virtue by setting humility and fear of God as the unshakable foundation of his spiritual dwelling place. He rejoiced to be despised and insulted, was completely free of anger, could speak no guile, and kept the remembrance of God ever in his spirit. If he came across men quarreling, he would run away as fast as he could. He used to say, I recommend you to get a small share in all the virtues. So rise early every day and acquire the beginning of every virtue and divine commandment with great patience. And I'm going to finish reading that as the last saying. So we actually don't have a lot of information about his life, which is interesting because we do have 47 recorded sayings from him, at least in this collection. So I think we'd start to learn more about him through what he actually said than from what we actually know about his life. I've picked 20 of the sayings to uh, run through. The first one is saying one. It's that story that we heard about in his life. It was said of Abba John the Dwarf that he withdrew and lived in the desert of Skidis with an old man of Thebes. His Abba, taking a piece of dry wood, planted it and said to him, Water it every day with a bottle of water until it bears fruit. Now the water was so far away that he had to leave in the evening and return the following morning. At the end of three years, the wood came to life and bore fruit. Then the old man took some of the fruit and carried it to the church, saying to the brethren, Take and eat the fruit of obedience. You know, monastic obedience is different than the obedience that we're called to. I think we've talked about this a little bit um, in the past. Monastic obedience is an obedience that you do unquestioningly, you know, without the slightest thought against it. The monastic obeys their um, abbots, their spiritual father, as they would Christ. They uh, see their spiritual father as standing and being in the person of Christ. And so, you know, it protects them because if their spiritual father is, does something wrong, they are protected um, because they're not okay? technically breaking the commands of Christ. They would be following the commands of something wrong their spiritual father said. On the other hand, we in the parish, we don't have this same obedience to the priests, to our bishops, in this unswerving, unquestioning way. We follow the commandments of Christ as he's given them to us. We try to follow um, to the best of our abilities You know, what the church lays out for normal Orthodox Christian life. You know, fasting, prayer, almsgiving, you know, all these things, scripture readings. And only in very rare cases do we, what might a priest um, in a parish kind of uh, call for that obedience that is, uh, you know, that might get close to monastic obedience, but it's still, it's never the same. So that's why you see um, a lot of people, they get confused and then sometimes get very suspicious of monastics because they have this certain kind of obedience that we don't have in the parish, that we're not called to in the parish. And so they, you know, they start to think wrong things about monasticism because... 
of uh, maybe something they hear that, you know, this monk had, you know, was doing this, you know, that's crazy or whatever. But they're not called, they're called to a greater degree, a higher degree than we are called to. So we always need to keep that in mind um, when we're thinking about the monks and nuns and, you know, lay people like us who are in the world, you know, secular Orthodox Christians, so to speak, those who are still in the world. Um, we don't have that same call to be obedient to, uh, you know, you guys don't have that call to be obedient to me like that. Um, and, you know, we all don't have that call to, you know, all, any priest or bishop. So we have saying number three. Abba John the Dwarf said, if a king wanted to take possession of his enemy's city, he would begin by cutting off the water and the food, and so his enemies, dying of hunger, would submit to him. It is the same with the passions of, of the flesh. If a man goes about fasting and hungry, the enemies of his soul grow weak. You know, fasting is a basic, foundational spiritual practice. If we don't do it, we're not going to make progress in the spiritual life. It's that simple. Sometimes when people are becoming orthodox, we can think, you know, this fasting thing is uh, whew, it's a, it's a real hard work. Just when we're not used to it. The goal is to understand that fasting is just a normal thing that we do, you know, week in and week out. It's not some spectacular feat, but it's just a small offering to God um, out of obedience, because he calls us to fast, but also um, to help us in the spiritual life, to help us learn how to overcome our own selves and to control ourselves. Saying five. He also said, going up the road again towards Skidis with some ropes, I saw the camel driver talking and he made me angry. So leaving my goods, I took to flight. There are a couple of sayings like this where, like we heard in his life, when um, people were quarreling, people got angry, he would just leave, he'd flee. Um, this camel driver was talking, you know, uh, without necessity, and he didn't want to be around it, so he left and made him angry, you know, that he was just blabbing away. Um, so once again, we have this uh, focus on necessary and un unnecessary speech. But what's interesting is that how serious he was about not being around those temptations. He um, practiced his asceticism to, with exactitude. Um, so that he wasn't even around it. Not only he himself wouldn't speak, obviously, without the need, but he didn't want to be other around others who didn't speak without need. Saying eight. One day when he was sitting in front of the church, the brethren were consulting him about their thoughts. One of the old men who saw it became a prey to jealousy and said to him, John, your vessel is full of poison. Abba John said to him, that is very true, Abba, and you have said that when you only see the outside, but if you were able to see the inside too, what would you say then? You know, it's uh, interesting how willing he is to take on a false accusation so that he can learn to be humble. On the other hand, how quickly do we try to, you know, uh, um, you know, speak against anything that might be false with us. Like, if someone offends us, we're like, no, 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 no. We're always trying to uh, fight against it rather than accept it like St. John here. Which, in this saying, also reminded me of, from a, of a saying from Abba Agathon, <clears throat> which is really interesting. I want to read that to you, too. There's a lot of correlation here. And I think... Abba Agathon saying explains what's going on with St. John here. It was said concerning Abba Agathon that some monks came to find him 
having heard tell of his great discernment. Wanting to see if he would lose his temper, they said to him, Aren't you that Agathon who is said to be a fornicator and a proud man? Yes, it is very true, he answered. They resumed, Aren't you that Agathon who is always talking nonsense? I am. Again they said, Aren't you Agathon the heretic? But at that he replied, I am not a heretic. So they asked him, Tell us why you accepted everything we cast you, but, re you, but repudiated this last insult. He replied, The first accusations I take to myself, for that is good for my soul. But heresy is separation from God. Now I have no wish to be separated from God. At this saying, they were astonished at his discernment and returned edified. So we can see kind of what's going on when these saints we read about, you know, they just kind of accept everything. They realize how beneficial it is for them to submit to the other person, to them, for them to humble themselves so as even to, you know, go so far as to being uh, called names and being accused of things that don't apply to them. Because it's good for their souls, for their humility, for their spiritual life. The next one is saying 11. We kind of heard about this in his life too. It was said of him that one day he was weaving a rope for two baskets. <clears throat> but he made it into one without noticing until it had reached the wall because his spirit was occupied in contemplation. This is a true prayer. He has no idea what's going on. You know, he's just weaving these baskets, but he's really enveloped in prayer. His hands are working, but his mind is somewhere completely else, somewhere else. Um, his mind is with God, while sometimes we find ourselves working and our minds aren't with God, they're, <laughs> they're somewhere else, but, uh, you know, they're thinking about, you know, what's going to be for dinner, or, uh, you know, when can I take my break from work here, <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this little shot of his life really uh, is kind of shaming for us that, Maybe we can um, a little bit, you know, start to pray when we work so that maybe we can um, get caught up in, you know, something good. Maybe just uh, even a small fraction of what he did. Saying 12. Abba John said, I am like a man sitting under a great tree who sees wild beasts and snakes coming against him in great numbers. When he cannot withstand them any longer, he runs to climb the tree and is saved. It is just the same with me. I sit in my cell and am aware of evil thoughts coming against me. And when I have no more strength against them, I take refuge in God by prayer and am saved from the enemy. This is another um, example of the teaching of fleeing to the Lord to retreat to God so that he can save us. We can't save ourselves with our own power. We're not strong enough. We like to think sometimes we are strong enough. We, think that, we like to think we're self-sufficient, but we're not. Um, we need to realize our weaknesses, our limitations in the spiritual life and uh, figure out when we need to, you know, turn especially to God and stop trying to do everything on our own. Saying 13. <clears throat> Abba Piman said of Abba John the Dwarf that he had prayed God to take his passions away from him so that he might become free from care. He went and told an old man this, I find myself in peace without an enemy. He said, the old man said to me him, Go beseech God to stir up warfare so that you may regain the affliction and humility that you, need to, that you used to have. For it is by warfare that the soul makes progress. So he besought God, and when warfare came, he no longer prayed that it might be taken away, but said, Lord, give me strength for the fight. So two things. Number one, this is just a confirmation of what we heard from St. Anthony, that without temptation, there's no salvation. We have to have that conflict to prove ourselves worthy. 
to show the Lord that we love him. And number two, we need to realize that um, this life is a battleground. St. John Chrysostom calls it an arena. You know, kind of like the Colosseum. Think about that. You know, this is where we do our battle. Um, and we shouldn't try to avoid the battles. We should, like St. John, pray for the strength to be victorious in the battles. Saying 16. The old man also said this to a certain brother about the soul which wishes to be converted. There was in a city a courtesan, that is a prostitute, who had many lovers. One of the governors approached her saying, promise me you will be good and I will marry you. She promised this and he took her and brought her to his house. Her lovers seeking her again said to one another, the Lord has taken her with him to his house. So if we go to his house and he learns of it, he will condemn us. But let us go to the back and whistle to her. Then when she recognizes the sound of the whistle, she will come down to us. As for us, we shall be unassailable. When she heard the whistle, the woman stopped her ears and withdrew to the inner chamber and shut the doors. The old man said that this courtesan is our soul, that her lovers are the passions and other men, that the Lord is Christ, that the inner chamber is the eternal dwelling. Those who whistle are the evil demons, but the soul always takes refuge in the Lord. <clears throat> when we try to make progress in the spiritual life, and we're actually trying to be close to God, and especially, um, I think, uh, for catechumens who are learning all these new things and trying to um, order your life according to the church. The demons hate these things. They hate us trying to get closer to God. And so we often see in these times that They'll come to do battle with us, just like we were talking about, because they don't want to release their grasp on us, on whatever it is, you know, whatever we're trying to overcome. Um, they don't want to release their grasp. And so it makes it very difficult. It makes it very hard. But if we can stop our ears, like it says in the saying, that is, if we can ignore, you know, those thoughts, um, those temptations, and retreat into ourselves and uh, be with the Lord, you know, we'll uh, be able to overcome. Saying 20. Abba John said, Who sold Joseph? A, bro a, <clears throat> a brother replied, saying, It was his brethren. The old man said to him, No, it was his humility which sold him, because he could have said, I am their brother. And have, and have objected. But because he kept silence, he sold himself by his humility. It is also his humility which set him up as chief in Egypt. <laughs> humility is uh, something that can raise us up to the heights. The lower we go, the higher God will exalt us. You know, this is what our Lord calls us to anyways is if you want to be first, you have to be last. You know, if you want to be great, you have to be a servant. You know, we have to find those instances in our lives where we can learn humility. You know, if we're married, you know, obviously that's in our marriage with our spouse. Those are, that, that situation is, you know, one of the best ways to learn humility. If we have children, it's another way to learn humility. You know, putting the, uh, the other's needs before our own. Putting ourselves down, denying ourselves, and trying to help the other. 
you know, these are, you know, just common ways that we can learn humility just in our families, in our lives. But we have to be willing to do it so that the Lord can exalt us, you know. Saying 21, Abba John said, We have put the light burden on one side, that is to say, self-accusation, and we have loaded ourselves with a heavy one, that is to say, self-justification. If you remember from Lent, our series on confession, we talked about confession is the time to be accusatory, not of others, but of ourselves. Because when we accuse ourselves before the judgment, when we judge ourselves before the judgment, God won't judge us for it, those things. But if we try to justify ourselves, make excuses, we might feel better now, <coughs> but we're still going to be judged for those things in the future, in the next life. Self-accusation is the... Uh, Christian way. This is why we see him being um, willing to be called, uh, you know, or that or to be told that his vessel is full of poison, or Abba Agathon being willing to be called, you know, these horrible uh, things because they want to. They don't even try. They don't only try to accuse themselves, but they allow others to falsely accuse them, so that they can learn that humility that's needed. That they can learn how to judge themselves to a greater degree, so that the Lord won't judge them. That He will be very lenient with them. <clears throat> Saying twenty-three. The same, Ab the same Abba was sitting in church one day and he gave a sigh, unaware that there was someone behind him. When he noticed it, he lay prostrate before him saying, forgive me Abba, for I have not yet made a beginning. So what I think this is saying is that obviously he was standing in church and he sighed from weariness. And then he realized that someone was there and it pricked him. He was saying to himself, you know, you can't even stand in church without even being tired. You know, he was still being overcome by bodily necessity. You know, we think it's kind of silly. You know, we often like to, uh, me, I stand at the altar, I'm yawning because of this or that thing. You know, uh, lately it's been Gregory doesn't like to sleep that well. And so, uh, you know, you get a few hours here, and then you fall asleep next to his bed for a couple hours, and then you wake up, and you go back to your bed, and, you know, this dance of beds. Um, you know, but we have, you know, our, our own lives, where, you know, we often really uh, cherish sleep. Um... And on the other hand, you have, you know, someone like St. John who's trying to overcome every bodily necessity. He's trying to be a complete master of himself. You know, take it to such an extreme degree that, you know, you only need, you know, this, minute, this, this much sleep or this much food or this much water. Just to barely keep themselves alive so they can, they, they can really, um, as our Lord calls us to, um, be uh, to feed on his, you know, every word that comes out of his mouth, to feed on true prayer rather than bread and water. Um, and so you have you know, this episode where he, he realizes someone's behind them and they, they heard him sigh from his weariness. And it's because of this, you know, he says he hasn't even made a beginning. It's just another example of how. Um, how far these saints will go in their uh, journey to be perfect. Saying 25. 
It was said of Abba John that when he went to church at Scythus, he heard some brethren arguing, so he returned to his cell. He went around it three times and then went in. Some brethren who had seen him wondered why he had done this, and they went to ask him. He said to them, My ears were full of that argument, so I circled round in order to purify them, and thus I entered my cell with my mind at rest. We see that uh, this argument it laid a burden on him that he didn't want to have to carry, even though he wasn't involved in the argument. You know, just think about in our own lives how even arguments or just things at work or whatever, you know, this or that. It's just being in the world, how much of a burden it is for our souls. Being around all oh, the hustle and bustle, being in traffic like many of you tonight, how much a burden. And it, that's not even necessarily sinful, you know, depending on what we do and how we act in all these situations. But, um, you know, imagine if we're, you know, around something like this, having an argument, or we ourselves are in an argument, something like this. You know, this world gives us such a burden to carry. You know, I think it's, we need to find our own ways to be able to do what uh, St. John did to kind of re- get rid of that burden. You know, that's number one of the reasons we have the narthex in the church. It's to kind of let everything go. You know, it's that, I mean, we don't say the narthex is the church, you know. You know, we have the narthex, we have the nave, and then we have, you know, the sanctuary, the holy place. You know, the narthex is the place to walk in, to, you know, take a deep breath, make your prayers to God, get yourself oriented so that you can then enter into the church and enter into, you know, the worship. It's the same way. We need to figure out the ways in our own lives. When we go home, you know, how do we release that stress from the world that uh, all the burdens that the world has laid upon our shoulders so that we can be at peace in our own homes and not uh, just walking around with all that stuff on us all the time. This also reminded me of when I was on Mount Athos, <clears throat> one of the monks told us that for those who really, for the monks who really know how to pray, you know, and they actually you know, have spiritual experiences, if they have to leave the holy mountain, it normally, and then when they come back, it normally takes at least three days to get that prayer back. Just because of all, you know, the hustle, the bustle, the burden of being in the cities. You know, obviously, a lot of times they go to Thessaloniki, you know, it's a large city. Um, and just because, you know, they were in all of that, they were out of, you know, they didn't have the peace, the silence that they normally have. Normally it takes them at least around three days to get the prayer back. You know, they lose their prayer, they lose their, you know, their deep communion with God, and it uh, takes some work to get it back. Remind me of that. So saying 32. <clears throat> the Saint Abba was very fervent. Now someone who came to see him praised his work, and he remained silent, for he was weaving a rope. Once again the visitor began to speak, and once again he kept silence. The third time he said to the visitor, since you came here, you have driven away God from me. And this is kind of like I was just talking about. You know, these, when you have, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know. When you have true prayer, and you're like fully enveloped in prayer, in communion with God through prayer. You know, if you have someone, if you have these situations that are... Um, confronting you, you know, you're, you're going to be very upset um, that these people are coming, you know, all these things, um, because you can't focus on that communion. You can't focus on that prayer. Um, and so he says, you've driven God away from me. So he doesn't have the prayer, you know, at that moment. He's got to regain it, you know, after the disturbances. <laughs> Saying 35. It was said of the same Abba John that 
when he returned from the harvest, or when he had been with some of the old men, he gave himself to prayer, meditation, and psalmody, until his thoughts were reestablished in their previous order. So this is just uh, another confirmation of what we've been saying. After he's been doing whatever he needs to do, he actually had to, you know, refocus himself, reorient himself back on those things that were truly precious to him, that, you know, the more important things. Um, as uh, our Lord told Martha, you know, the one thing needful. Saying 39. Abba John the Dwarf said, A house is not built by beginning at the top and working down. You must begin with the foundations in order to reach the top. They said to him, What does this saying mean? He said, The, fo the foundation is our neighbor, whom we must win, and that is the place to begin. For all the commandments of God, for all the commandments of Christ, depend on this one. So he's talking about, you know, loving our neighbor. Our Lord said, the two greatest commandments to love God and love our neighbor. You know, how do we show our love for God? By loving our neighbor. Now, if we don't love our brother who we see, how can we say we love God whom we haven't seen? You know, this is uh, the teaching of St. John, the theologian. Um, and so, this he's saying this is the foundation for us. But, you know, if we want to expand that out and talk, you know, generally, not just in this specific case of loving the neighbor on uh, the way to build our spiritual house, but just having a good foundation to build our spiritual lives on. You know, a lot of the times, people, they want to, or they wonder why, you know, this or that, you know, thing in their life is kind of rocky. You know, it's not stable. And then you figure out, you know, oh, well, you know, they're not praying consistently every day. You know, they're not doing scripture reading consistently every day. And, you know, they neglect to fast, you know, every once in a while. And so you, you see, they haven't laid a good foundation for their life. They laid a rocky foundation. And so everything that they've built off of that has been rocky. It's been shaky. But when we can lay a good foundation, we can be consistent in our prayer rules. We can be faithful in our fasting. When we can offer alms as we can, you know, do these basic spiritual practices that you know, we're all called to do. This is how we can lay a good foundation and how we can show the Lord that we can take on more responsibility, that we actually start building that spiritual house. You know what? We have to show him that we're faithful in a little so that he can give us a lot or just a little bit more, you know, as we can. Saying 40. <clears throat> this is a long one, but it's worth it. What follows was said about Abijan. The parents of a young girl died and she was left an orphan. She was called Paisia. She decided to make her house a hospice for the use of the fathers of Scythis. So for a long time she gave hospitality and served the fathers. But in the course of time her resources were exhausted and she began to be in want. Some wicked men came to see her and turned her aside from her aim. She began to live an evil life to the point of becoming a prostitute. The fathers, learning this, were deeply grieved, and calling Abba John the dwarf, said to him, We have learnt that this sister is living an evil life. While she could, she gave us charity, so now it is our turn to offer her charity and to go to her assistance. Go to see her then, and according to the wisdom which God has given you, put things right for her. <clears throat> so Abba John went to her and said to the old do doorkeeper, Tell your mistress I am here. But she sent him away, saying, From the beginning you have eaten her goods, and see how poor she is now. Abba John said to her, Tell her I have something which will be very helpful to her. The doorkeeper's children, mocking him, said to him, What have you to give her that makes you want to meet her? He replied, How do you know what I am going to give her? The old man went up and spoke to, the, to her mistress about him. 
Paisia said to her, These monks are always going about in the region of the Red Sea and finding pearls. Then she got ready and said to the doorkeeper, Please bring him to me. As, she was com as he was coming up, she prepared for him and lay down on the bed. Abijan entered and sat down beside her. Looking into her eyes, he said to her, What have you got against Jesus that you behave like this? When she heard this, she became completely rigid. Then Abijan bent his head and began to weep copiously. She asked him, Ab, why are you crying? He raised his head, then lowered it again, weeping, and said to her, I see Satan playing in your face. How should I not weep? Hearing this, she said to him, Abba, is it possible to repent? He replied, yes. She said, take me wherever you wish. Let us go, he said, and she got up to go with him. Abba John noticed that she did not make any arrangements that she did not make any arrangements with regard to her house. He said nothing, but he was surprised. When they reached the desert, the evening drew on. He, making a little pillow with the sand and marking it with the sign of the cross, said to her, Sleep here. Then a little further on, he did the same for himself and said his prayers and lay down. Waking in the middle of the night, he saw a shining path reaching from heaven to her, and he saw the angels of God bearing away her soul. So he got up and went to touch her feet. When, she saw, when he saw that she was dead, he threw himself face downwards on the ground, praying to God. <clears throat> he heard this. One single hour of repentance has brought her more than the penitence of many who persevere without showing such fervor in repentance. How great is repentance? You know, this is our, what we're called to do. This is our life. Repentance is just a turning towards God. This is what we're called to do every minute of every day, just to return back to God, turn away from you know what our sinful desires and turn to God. And in that <clears throat> short amount of time, she who had fallen in such a into a dissolute life, she was saved, and the angels received her soul because of her great repentance. She turned to God and completely turned away from her past life. As it said, she didn't make any arrangements. She just went. She just went to follow St. John into the desert to find her salvation. And because of that, she was saved. Another thing we should take away is that no matter what we do in life, no matter what has happened in the past, if we repent of it, we can be saved. There's no sin, no passion, no anything that can separate, separate us from God forever. If we're willing to repent and to show that uh, we're disgusted by that past, that sin, and that we turn back to God. Saying 42. Abba John said to his brothers, Even if we are entirely despised in the eyes of men, let us rejoice that we are honored in the sight of God. <clears throat> you know, this is, uh, this is the way of the righteous from the Old Testament to the New Testament to up to today. You know, you have so many examples. The righteous Job despised in the eyes of men. They said, God has forsaken you. His wife said that. You know, just curse God and die. But in truth, he was honored in the sight of God, which is why he was going through those trials. Obviously, we have, uh, you know, all the examples of the apostles. You know, they were despised in the eyes of men. And they were killed. But they are honored in the sight of God. And this is, uh, in every generation, every century, until the present one, we have the righteous who are despised in the eyes of men because people don't understand the true Christian life. But God recognizes them. I mean, we have what I talked about, actually, you know, um, in the beginning, St. Nectarios. He was greatly despised, kicked out of his bishopric, in the Church of Alexandria, 
He went to Greece. He was still, people didn't trust him. They believed the lies that were said about him before, but it didn't matter to him because he knew whose esteem was greater. It was God's, not uh, you know, all these other people. Three more. Saying 43. Abba Piman said that Abba John said that the saints are like groups of trees, each bearing different fruit, but watered from the same source. The practices of one saint differ from those of another, but is the same spirit that works in all of them. And this is why we especially need to read the lives of the saints, so that we can go to each tree and pick the fruit. You know, what can we take from this person? What can we take from this person? What can we take from this person, you know? We should always uh, be on the move, moving from here to there, looking for what, you know, some kind of encouragement, some kind of virtue, some kind of, you know, um, challenge, whatever it is, in the lives of these uh, holy ones for us to um, kind of try to imbue um, into our own lives. But on the other hand, we don't have to just look at the lives of the saints. You know, we do have holy people alive today, which is why the world hasn't ended yet. You know, we can, if we hear about a holy person, why not go and try to meet them, try to learn something from them? You know, see if we can actually, you know, if we hear about some person who's a living saint, go, why not? Just uh, this past week, I read about um, a monk from St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai who just passed away. Just reposed. He was a modern day fool for Christ. Um, you know, he tried to present himself as kind of crazy to the world so that he could hide his spiritual gifts. That's what a fool for Christ does. Um, you know, they're not actually crazy, but they act like it so that, um, you know, people don't um, give them glory. They don't chase after them, but they want to be hidden. Um, you know, but people still saw in him and people would still go to him um, and try to get, you know, a word from him. But I said he had often only give them one, two or three words, not much else. So there's still these people alive today. You know, if we have the opportunity and to meet, you know, someone like this, <clears throat> and we should uh, try to. Saying 45. The old man also said, "You know that the first blow the devil gave to Job was through his possessions, and he saw that he had not grieved him nor separated him from God." With the second blow, he touched his flesh. But the brave athlete did not sin by any word that came out of his mouth in that either. In fact, he had within his heart that which is of God, and he drew on that source unceasingly. And so if we uh, possess God, if we truly have the Lord dwelling in us, no matter what happens externally, no matter what we lose, no matter the sicknesses, you know, whatever it is, if we have the Lord dwelling in us, we can draw on that source. We can be refreshed. We can realize that we have everything that we could ever need. And we can be able to, you know, um, overcome any temptation or trial because of that, using Job as our example. And lastly, I'm going to go back to saying 34. Abba John said, I think it is best that a man should have a little bit of all the virtues. Therefore, get up early every day and acquire the beginning of every virtue and every commandment of God. Use great patience with fear and long suffering in the love of God with all the fervor of your soul and body. Exercise great humility, bear with interior distress, be vigilant and pray often with reverence and groaning 
with purity of speech and control of your eyes. When you are despised, do not get angry. Be at peace and do not render evil for evil. Do not pay attention to the faults of others and do not try to compare yourself with others, knowing you are less than every created thing. Renounce everything material and that which is of the flesh. Live by the cross, in warfare, in poverty, of spirit, in voluntary, in voluntary spiritual asceticism, in fasting, penitence, and tears, in discernment, in purity of soul, taking hold of that which is good. Do your work in peace. Persevere in keeping vigil, in hunger, in thirst, in cold, in nakedness, and in sufferings. Shut yourself in a tomb as though you are already dead, so that all times you will think death is near. I think all of these things, we can find ways to adapt them into our lives. You know, he's giving us a blueprint for how to live spiritual lives, not just uh, earthly lives. But I think we can adapt those things to fit you know, our 21st century American lives. And it's not going to be the same. We're not going to be able to do the same things to the same degree. Even if you were monks and nuns, we wouldn't be able to do the same things that he did. But we can find ways to make them work in our lives. You know, we can allow ourselves to be despised, like he said. I mean, that's, that's not uh, any great thing except for us to, you know, be humble about it. We can kind of do these things. I think uh, that's how I wanted to end because, you know, such a great word from this saint of how to live a spiritual life. So with that, I'll ask if there's any questions.